Well, welcome to the first 2024 get together of the, uh, we used to be called the three uh, musketeers. Now I think my wife has, has mentioned us in the term of the three musketeers. I don't know what that really means, but, uh, but happy new year to you and to, uh, uh, all of our folks that are uh, joining us, some of you are here for the first time. So I think I just want to take a half a second and uh, uh, introduce myself. I'm Paul Merriman. I founded this organization about 11 years ago, the Foundation, Financial Education Foundation. And uh, and our, our goal, a mission is to teach do-it-yourself investors to do it better. That's what we're all about. And here with me, uh, one of the uh, powerhouses behind doing it better is Chris Pedersen. Uh, Chris has been with us since 2016 and uh, developed the Two Funds for Life strategy and put together the best-in-class ETFs. Uh, he's been uh, so valuable to helping uh, the folks that follow our work uh, do it better. And Daryl Balls, Daryl Balls, uh, Daryl, uh, what year did we start working together? Do you remember? Uh, I would say maybe 2015, 2016, okay. something like and, that. And we had been friends for 20 years, I think, prior to that. But uh, uh, yeah. your, your work and putting together a uh, I think over 200 different tables that you update each year now. Uh, uh, we have people clamoring right now, wanting to know when are the tables going to be out. But I have to wait for the data. I need. I the know. Data. I, you know. That's what I. <laughs> but I say it so nicely that. Yeah. <laughs> but but the bottom line is, the three of us and 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 a team of other people who support us. Um, we are here to try to help you be better at this process of investing. And, 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 and we're here to find ways to help the first time investor. And we're here to help the people who are just coming into retirement. And, and then finally, those who are in the final years of their lives and are trying to figure out what they can do for others in their family. We are not, we are not financial planners. Uh, we are focused uh, purely on the process uh, of investing. So what we what we do with these meetings, and what we I think we meet about once a month to 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 take some questions and maybe to discuss things that are on our mind about topics that we think you'll be interested in. And of course, the thing that uh, people tend to be most interested in is uh, performance and uh, the performance that uh, we've helped people get in the last year has been good. Uh, I, I'm sure that people who missed out on the cryptocurrency move are wishing they hadn't listened to us when we said, no, that's a speculation, that's not an investment. Still feel that way, even though it is now becoming uh, recognized uh, as it's 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 available through an ETF and other ways that that are going to continue to to make it legitimate at the same time as it is still a speculation, not an investment. But um, Chris, you've done some marvelous work that I think uh, we should spend some time talking about here today because a lot of folks may not know about the work that you have done in putting together uh, the, the configurator. And uh, how about taking a few minutes here and, and, and describing the work that you've done and the lessons that have come from it for you. Um, and then we'll talk something about the performance of, uh, of these strategies that uh, that you're going to to introduce to a lot of people who are new. There's also some new functionality that just got added to the configurator. So I think it will be uh, a fun thing to take a peek at. And I know that some people in the audience have already been peeking at it because uh, 
when I'm working on it, I can see that other people are logged in. <laughs> oh, and uh, so it's kind of fun to know that there's a little bit of a little bit of interest out there. The way you get to the configurator on the website is you come up here to portfolios, and then you go down here to portfolio configurator. Once you're in the portfolio configurator and you've got these instructions over here, it's pretty simple. And what it does is it helps you learn what funds you might want to use to implement one of our portfolios and also what characteristics the portfolio using those funds is going to have. And you can look at these individually or as a family. So let's just follow the instructions and see what we get. Let's say that you wanted to use a worldwide four fund that's 70% US and 30% international. Well, you would look in the list and click on that one. And immediately, one of the things you see is that it eliminated here on this chart that shows the, you can think of it as a uh, a, a picture of how valuey the portfolio is or how discounted the equities are inside and also how big the companies are. Immediately, a whole bunch of dots went away and you're just left with these here in the middle. And so you can see that these portfolios, they range from one that's bigger and less valuey implemented with Vanguard mutual funds to one down here on the left that is smaller and more value or cheaper implemented with the best in class ETFs. So you can already start to see how uh, your choice of the funds that you're gonna make later on is gonna impact the outcome. But let's continue just with the instructions. So we've got the worldwide four fund, 70% US, 30% international. We're gonna say we're gonna do that in a tax deferred account and I, I'm not going to add any fixed income initially. You could later. And then we'll choose the best in class ETFs. And as soon as you pick the fund family, it brings up over here on the right, the actual funds that we recommend, as well as the percentages that we recommend uh, for implementing the portfolio that has the characteristics you chose over on the left. So it's a worldwide four fund, 70% US, 30% international. And that means it's got some U.S. large cap blend, 35 percent, U.S. small cap value, 35 percent, international large cap value, 15 percent, and international small cap blend, 15 percent. Now, you can add, if you want, some fixed income to that. Let's say we want to add 20 percent fixed income. And now you see the bonds down below get added in along with the funds and the equities get reduced appropriately. So you still have that equity portfolio that you chose. But um, what's new, well, actually, before we leave this, you get some characteristics of that portfolio as well. You can see its expense ratio. You can see the price to earnings, the yield that it produces or has produced, I should say, over the last 12 months, um, the US percent, international percent, and emerging markets percent that you end up with. And some people are looking at this going, wait a minute, there's no emerging markets fund. Why do you have 1% in emerging markets? Well, there's there's a little leakage. These funds are never exactly what the label says. So sometimes an international fund, even though it says international developed, will have a little bit in emerging markets, for example. Um, and Chris, if I, if I could just enter one, one point. This yeah. is the best in class ETF, and 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 you made a reference. It's a kind of it's a fund family, if you will. But really, it is also these are all funds ETFs that are available at Fidelity, at Schwab, at yeah. Vanguard, uh, and and others. Uh, and you have to check to make sure uh, of this with others, but on a on a non commission commission free basis. So these are all available at Vanguard, uh, even though these are, you're going to show here maybe in a second, an actual Vanguard portfolio. Right. Here's we do have a Vanguard ETF portfolio, um, which you, you I can choose that and you can implement it with Vanguard. If you know, if you're really motivated by their low expense ratio and you notice the expense ratio went down to 0.09% versus best in class, which was 
0.2%. So, so it's cheaper, but you can also see over here that the Vanguard uh, has a price to book of roughly 2.1 and a market cap of 14.5 billion where the best in class has a price to book of 1.7 roughly and 11.9 as a market, uh, market cap. So it's more value oriented. You're paying a little bit to get access to those cheaper stocks. And the reason they're best in class is that we believe you're going to make more money because it's more value oriented in the long run uh, by paying that 0.2% for the added exposure to the value factor. But to, to what Paul was saying, um, you know, these are all chosen down here in the fund families, not because they're all always from that company. So, for example, if I cl click on Fidelity, you'll see this iShares fund is used for international value. Well, that is a commission free fund available at Fidelity. So all of the funds when you pick fund family are commission free at that company and they were chosen to be the best ones available that are commission free within that fund family. So unless there's any other questions on the, the basic portfolio configuration or configurator, what I wanted to highlight is that I've added additional pages over here on the left. Previously, we had this page called glossary and notes that described some of the uh, the acronyms that might not be familiar or the abbreviations that we used in the sources of information. But I've just added um, this page called Two Funds for Life. And it follows a similar kind of structure, <clears throat> but the portfolio strategies on the left are all mixes of a target date fund and a US small cap value fund. Um, the first one is actually a pure target date fund but the rest are various mixes going with 90% target date fund up to 10% target date fund and 90% in small cap value. Uh, and then we have also the choice of the fund year. And since the fund controls the amount that's in fixed income, uh, we calculate the fixed income percentage that you end up with when you choose one of these combinations. And what's interesting? What, what do you mean end up with, Chris? Because doesn't it vary throughout the lifetime? It of the it, it it does, and I'll 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 come back to that in just a second, Daryl. You'll okay. you'll see, um, and you can actually see over here on the right how, for for example, if you average them all together, this is the glide path you get. But if I pick the target date fund, you can see the equity allocation over here on the right, depending on which retirement year you have chosen. And as soon as you pick a year, like 2040, now you've locked yourself into a specific allocation to fixed income of 23.6%. But if I increase the amount that I've allocated to the target date fund, say I go 50-50, um, so 50% in a target date fund, 50% in small cap value, now the fixed income percentage in that total portfolio goes down. Now it's 11.8% because- But that, it, that's right at, sorry. That's right at this particular time. As, as the fund moves through time, that will change. Exactly. And According if you want to, to see the, the whole path glide path, them, then right. deselect the particular <clears throat> year that you want to use. And you can right. see the whole glide path now for a 2050. You can see it for a 2080. <laughs> which is pretty extreme. Most people wouldn't ride that glide path because it only gets you down to 86% in equities. But I think the 50-50, people might actually live with that for a lifetime. And um, that gets you to a 65% allocation to equities in retirement. If that sounds hot, you could go with a 60-40. That gets you down to a 60% allocation or a 70-30. So you've got these choices and what is really interesting is now I can take, for example, uh, let's let's take an 80-20 allocation, 80% 80 in the target date fund, 20% in small cap value. And you can see what the equity portfolio looks like for all of the different time horizons here on our chart of size and value. And now you can go back to the sound investing portfolios and 
you can see, for example, uh, what the Worldwide Four Fund looks like, and you can compare the two. And it, it's interesting. They're not that far apart. The two fund for life portfolios are actually a little bit smaller and uh, the uh, are actually a little bit larger and the uh, the four fund portfolios are a little bit smaller, but they both reach into similar kinds of value space. So if you wanted to compare and say, well, what kind of a portfolio might get me close to a 100%, let's look at the ultimate buy and hold with a 70-30 because most of the two funds for life are 70-30s. Uh, you can you can pull that up and you can even select best in class. And you can see where the ultimate buy and hold 70-30 best in class sits. And then you can go for two to the two funds for life and say, well, what might be close to that? And you can deselect this and you can see, well, it was down around in here. So a two fund for life, 70, 30 target date fund and small cap value in 2015 would actually be pretty close to that, which is kind of interesting because that's a, a mature allocation, um, yes. which would have more fixed income. So in that sense, they're very different, but in terms of the actual equities in the portfolio, they'd be very similar. Yeah. Uh, did I hear a question? Yeah. Can you click on one of those those meatballs on that chart and, and select the, the... You can. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now we can come back. So you can pick. You can, you can see that they're pretty close to each other. Yeah. You can pick where you want to be in the space and click on it, and that'll show you the portfolio that does that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So... I, you know, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I think uh, hopefully the listeners will find some value in it. And I've included on page three my fine tuning table that we talked about in a previous podcast. This one's not interactive, but for people considering two funds for life, I think it's uh, it's a useful reference just to have right next to all the other material that you're looking at. So, um, so yeah, that's the update to the portfolio configurator. And and just in case people did not see you discuss this this table, I think it would be worthwhile here to just take a few minutes and walk them through uh, this because here we actually have some performance data that you don't have in the configurator. Uh, and correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the, conf the configurator is there to show you what the characteristics of the portfolio are if you build it with particular funds. And what it doesn't do is tell you how those funds have done in the past or how that asset allocation has done in the past. And what Daryl's back testing and tables do and what my fine tuning table for two funds for life do is the second part. They, they say, well, how have these performed in the past? And basically what this table, the two fund for life fixed allocation, lump sum annually rebalanced fine tuning table does is very similar to, to Daryl's tables, except it combines a lot of different portfolios on a single page. And for those who are maybe listening and not watching across the top, you have different vintages or years of target date funds. So it runs the gamut from all the way into retirement, seven years or more into retirement, down to 25 years or more before retirement in five-year increments. And then on the vertical axis, what you get to do is decide, well, how much, tar how much small cap value am I going to put in this portfolio? So you can go 0% and you're 100% in the target date fund, or you can go 10% in small cap value, 90% in the target date fund, all the way up to a 50-50 um, allocation to small cap value and the target date fund. And within each of those boxes, then you can see what the historical compound rate of return was. You can see what the worst 10-year compound rate of return was. You can see the worst drawdown uh, going back to 1970, and you can see the 30-year safe withdrawal rate for an approximation of this allocation going back to 1928. So I think it's really valuable because for a young person, they can look at it and say, well, you know, I care 
not as much about the bumpy ride. I care more about return that might nudge them, for example, to a 50-50 allocation or even more. Um, for somebody who is a retiree and they want to know, well, I, where, what gives me the highest safe withdrawal rate? They can they can find that with a mature allocation or or maybe they don't care about the safe withdrawal rate. Maybe they want the highest return and they've, you know, they've oversaved and they've lived a life with uh tolerating a lot of volatility, they they could pick a box that's more volatile. So I think it just lays out a very wide range of choices in equity allocation, small cap value tilt, and fixed income tilt. And it gives people the choice to pick and live in a box, or it gives them the choice to pick a row and and let the target date fund move them along if they want and just continue to use the same target date fund. So I, I I, I think it's uh, hopefully it's very useful both to young people and and old people who want to simplify their portfolios and still get good returns per unit of risk. Yeah. So so let me just do a little exercise here. I'll be speaking to college uh, seniors uh, in a couple of months, and um, and and I would certainly want them to put at least twenty percent in small cap value and the balance in the target date fund at a, at a minimum. And what I can see here then, they should in theory uh, be thinking that they could get, you've got it here, 10.8% for that from age, let's call it 22 to 40. That mm-hmm. that would be a reasonable thing for them to think could happen to them. Um, and that the worst 10 year period they would have experienced uh, during that that period would have been a a gain of 2.6 percent a year instead of 10.8, right? Yeah, and uh, I mean that's the his, history going back to 1970 would suggest those are very reasonable expectations, and they should also expect not in the early years when their deposits or their contributions are really big compared to the balance, but somewhere along the way, they'll probably experience a 50% drawdown as well. And, and possibly even more because going back to 1928, they were, they were deeper. Yeah. But the, one of the teaching principles I hope you bring to them is that the way you earn your return, you know, this is not money for nothing. The way you earn these returns is by bearing prudent risk, by tolerating volatility. You know, you're taking a job and your job is to ignore the ups and downs of the market and invest in things that have real value and growth in earnings and a, a high likelihood of delivering you a good return. And after they've made it through that first 20 years, theoretically, they can see that the next five years, instead of 10.8, it's 10.7. And the next five years, instead of 10.7, is 10.5. And they can follow what might happen Yes, all the way through to the end of their life, actually, if they wish. Yep. Uh, and... and uh, we don't have a calculator that allows you to just do that. I don't think anyway, at this point, no. that allows you to do that. But at least the basic numbers are here. And as you say, right in that same box is the worst drawdown. And that's what you're signing on for. Again, you make that, that, that case well. So I think this is a powerful table. What, Daryl? In the past. These are all historical data, right, Chris? Yep. Yep. All in the past. The other thing, you know, a young person may have trouble relating to this, but imagine they're coming up on retirement, right? Five years before retirement, and they really want to know how much money they have to retire on. Well, the target date fund is going to reduce that risk. And if they're in that 80-20 row, then... Unless small cap value has outperformed by a lot, which it may have, um, 
the risk in that box declines to 37%. Now, if they're annually rebalancing, which is the way this chart is built, then instead of 50%, now they're less than 40% drawdown. So there's more certainty in terms of how much money they would have in retirement. And around retirement, when they're starting to live off their savings, it's down to almost 30%. And you know, into retirement, it's down to 22 So yeah, you can see that ride and you can see where you, know, you might be nervous nearing retirement. The target date fund is trying to pull some risk off the table. And if you find out you've oversaved as you get into retirement, you know, maybe you decide to either increase your allocation to small cap value or, uh, or go back in time, <laughs> pick up one of those target date funds that doesn't mature till later so that you have a higher equity allocation. This chart lets you make all of those decisions with at least some historically meaningful information. Yeah. And what these young people and older people are going to start seeing more of is uh, some recent research has come out that recommends people be all equity all the time, all of their life, yeah. uh, which I think is is in many ways outrageous. Uh, and, and I've fought against that because I'm not sure that people really understand what that's going to be like when that portfolio is down 50, 60, or 70%. And, and, uh, but they're going to see a lot more of that kind of, 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 uh, uh, of research. And, and so this is really overall pretty conservative strategy. I think, uh, the only thing I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to convince young people to do is to consider uh, doing the target, building their own do-it-yourself target date fund so we can further fine tune this. But I, I'll tell you, for the people who don't want to spend that extra time, Chris, I think this is a fantastic, terrific piece of work for the for the young and, and even middle-aged uh, uh, savers. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Um, I did. I did also. Uh, I, I wanted to take. There was a question that came in uh, that fits nicely right here, and that's what's the highest return per unit of risk portfolio you've back tested, and why shouldn't we all use it? So. Um, Actually, Daryl, I think if you happen to have H1 in your pocket, or maybe uh, it's I H2. Right now, but give me a second and I can go find it. Okay. You can talk about something else for a minute. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll talk about the chart we just shared. Uh, the highest return per unit of risk, if you just did something that's kind of like a, it's not like a sharp ratio, but it's close. I mean, it, it'll still pick the highest sharp ratio one. If you just took the compound annual growth rate and divided it by the, the standard deviation, the highest return per unit of risk is actually a mature target date fund. Um, just the target date fund. Because Tell us about that. Why? Because it's it's got a lot of bonds in there, so it gives you uh, it gives you an eight percent historical rate of return. That's that's what the compound rate of return was, and the the standard deviation was only six percent. So your worst drawdown was seventeen percent. So it's kind of a nervous Nelly portfolio, and that's probably why the target date funds are built the way they are, mm -hmm. is that they realize for people who have saved just enough and maybe aren't really financially savvy and are well into retirement, they just want to know that their money's going to last and they're not worried about much of a legacy. Yeah. And they want to see a, a stable amount of money in that balance. Does that, does that suggest that any extra money that came out of the investment that was not the target date fund by itself did not only get a higher return because it took more risk, but it didn't give you a higher unit of return per unit of risk. In other words, it's not perfect for what we would like to think it could be. Is that a fair conclusion? I, I think it's a fair conclusion that most of the time, 
to get a higher return, you're going to have to take more risk. Right. Right. That is a fair conclusion. And you may have to take, at least in terms of that way of measuring it, you may have to tolerate more risk than you see in return in, in just in that ratio. Yeah. But another way to look at it, another measure of return per unit of risk is how resilient is this portfolio to sequence of returns? And the proxy for that would be safe withdrawal rate on here. And the safe withdrawal rate for the mature target date fund is 3.5%, but the safe withdrawal rate for the 40% small cap value, 60% target date fund at maturity is 4.9%. That's a big deal. So different way to measure return per unit of risk. I mean, I, I would say you're in less risk of running out of money using that option. So that's a different, a different way of measuring risk. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's really why there isn't one recommendation for the highest return per unit of risk is that your definition of risk will be personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you find right. it, Daryl? Right. And yes, I did find it. Paul. Good. All right. Let's, let's look at the unit of return per unit of risk uh, in these portfolios as we've looked at them. Now, this is, this is the table that, shows the returns both by decades, during the good years, during the bad years, with the sharp ratio and the standard deviation and the Sortino ratio. I mean, it's looking at these combinations of equity asset classes and turning them inside out short term as well as long term. And uh, there's another page that uh, shows the annual return of all of these different portfolios. But here's my question for you guys. If I am looking for the best unit of return per unit of risk, which of these portfolios um, is the best, Is at least historically, has done that, given the best return for a unit of risk? Depends on how you define risk or, or how you define the unit of return per unit of risk. The the the, well, the, we just the, talked about the ratio sharp. and the Sortino ratio both kind of do that. Um, yeah. Standard deviation is an indication of volatility, which some people consider risk. Okay, let's use, I think that that uh, Chris was just using the sharp ratio uh, as a way of, of measuring uh, uh, th that unit of return per unit of risk, which would suggest that and the higher the number, the better the the return, correct? Correct. Okay. Per and unit, so per unit of risk, right? We have almost a tie, or there are, uh, looks like the worldwide all value uh, is good. The US all value is good. Uh, and the two funds, it's interesting. The, the combination of the half S and P five hundred and the half uh, small cap value; those uh, would be the better performers here. As anybody want to to say that that the U.S. four fund should and and the worldwide ultimate buy and hold should all? I mean, the difference between all of them is not great. Is that a fair statement? Well, I think when you look at, if you look at the sharp ratios and you look across the, the range, the, the red numbers look across the, the range of portfolios for a given time span the, in the sharp ratio block there, mm -hmm. the, the minimum for the whole range, this is from 1970 to 22, uh, is 0.75 to 0.81. Is that significant difference? No. I don't think so, not in my opinion. For 1970 to 1979, which is the next row down, it's 0.44 to 0.77. Is that significantly different? I again might argue not that significant because the numbers aren't that high to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, you look at 80 to 89, the, the blue number is 2.8 and the red number is 1.3. The worldwide all small cap value and the U.S. all small cap value. 
interesting. The worldwide all small cap was the best and the US all small cap was the worst during the 80s. So that's kind of interesting. But is that significantly different? Yeah, it's it's a factor of two, a little bit like like the decade before, but the numbers are higher. So maybe uh, same thing for the 90s. The factor difference between the max and the min is about a factor of two. This time it's the S&P 500 instead of the worldwide all small cap value being the worst. Uh, same thing in the in the 90s, although there it's a little bit different. They're all pretty small, but but the uh, the worldwide all small cap value is is five times uh, as the better. Uh, so so what you've just pointed out here is that if we look at the whole period, the range of sharp ratio is is this little difference. But if it, we look it, at it, ten year periods, the differences are substantial. Well, it, it does bounce around. The one thing that that jumps out at me when I look at this and I say, well, where's the most blue and where's the most red? Yeah. Well, the most blue is over on the, on the right side under the, the worldwide all value, all U.S. all value, mm -hmm. and the worldwide all small cap value. Uh, three out of the five are uh, there, plus the total over the whole period is there mm -hmm. also. So three out of the mm -hmm. five decades plus the whole to total. And there's not much blue in the S&P. Column. There is a little bit, and it is more recent, but uh, and the, there is a lot of red in the S and P five hundred column, and uh, there's some red out on the small cap value. So, to me, what that says is that the better risk versus return using the sharp ratio includes a lot of value, right um, on the on the right side. Some of the some of the other. Uh, Portfolios, the ultimate buy and hold, the four fund portfolios, and and even the the two fund portfolios, they they do what they what they said they would do. They sort of smooth the ride, or they're sort of in the middle. You've got diversification. You're not out on the edges one way or the other. Yeah. And so it's not no surprise to me that you don't see them as being the best return per unit of risk or the worst return per unit yeah. of risk. Um, it and one big difference uh, between this chart and the two fund for life fine tuning table chart is that this one doesn't include any fixed income. From a lot of my back testing, I know that the all small cap value uh, in small proportion, like say 20% plus 80% in fixed income, short term treasuries, is a very high return per unit of risk. That's a Larry Swedro barbell, roughly. Um, yep. And the reason is you have two things that are very different from one another. You have the, the bonds that are poorly correlated to the small cap value, and that gives you a great benefit of diversification. And so you get a relatively high return for low volatility. But again, going back to this, what would be the highest return per unit of risk for you, for the individual investor? I think there's a lot of investors who could not invest in a barbell portfolio with conviction for the long term, because it means all of your equities are in small cap value. Most of your portfolio is in fixed income. And when the news is talking about how wonderful the S&P 500 has done, you're going to have nothing but regret and be second guessing your decision. So I would say that even though on paper, that's a high return per unit of risk from a behavioral standpoint, it's a high unit of return with a lot of personal behavioral risk for many investors. And I, I think that's that's why this question I thought was interesting because there's so many different ways to measure risk and so many different ways to optimize it. So it, it becomes very personal. The other thing to, to consider when you're looking at the sharp ratio is that it, it uses a standard deviation, which is it's um, includes volatility on the downside, but it also includes volatility on the upside. Yep. It penalizes the portfolio in terms of risk for being volatile on the upside just as much as it does on the downside. And 
not too many people, I don't think, care about volatility on the upside. In fact, it may be a, a thing they like to see. But volatility on the downside is what bothers them a lot. And that's what the Sortino ratio attempts to do. The difficulty with the Sortino ratio is that there's not a, a lot of times there's not enough data to really create a meaningful figure. That's what NMF means, no meaningful figure. And that's because there's in some decades, there's no losing year. And you need a losing year if you're going to incorporate volatility on the downside. So you can't calculate volatility on the downside when there's no downside during that decade. So um, you expect, Daryl, that certainly by the end of February that DFA will have produced their information that you need in, in order to, to update this uh, through the end of this year. And, and or last year, and that's not going to change anything significantly. Uh, but I know uh, people are always interested in the latest information. Um, does that seem reasonable in terms of your your experience with access to the past results? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, far be it for me to tell DFA when to publish their numbers, right. but. <laughs> Sooner would be better, guys, if you're listening. Yeah, sure. But um, but yeah, I think by mid-February, they usually typically have them out. I checked this morning, and uh, the only thing that is is there is they do have the return data for December for the fixed income part. Oh, okay, good. But nothing nothing on equities yet. So, so we'll take, a, take a second. Uh, I In the newsletter uh, that went out this week, uh, we promoted – uh, this DFA, the, the the film about the document, a documentary about the DFA, uh, and then the interview um, with uh, the guys up at um, Rational Reminder Podcast uh, of the of the fellow who directed and produced the uh, the movie, uh, and and you your response to me when you had seen it uh, was very positive. But why don't you just Take take a second and 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 give us just a little feedback about having watched. This. There's three hours between those two, yeah, the, almost, the film yeah. and the interview. There's three hours. Um, and and Daryl, how did what was your feeling? Uh well, the the podcast is is very different than the the movie. The movie tune out the no, The title is tune out the noise. Right. Um, the podcast is is an interview with the um, I don't know if he's a producer, director, maybe he's all of that um, that put the movie together. Um, and I guess he's won Academy Awards or some a whole bunch of boards. It's, and it's very well it's put together very well. And I could see why uh, he may have won those awards. But it's an interesting uh, interview to on the process of of putting together the the movie the uh the movie itself is very interesting because it it basically goes through the history of the the research that led to the formation of dimensional fund advisors and then uh the academic research that's behind that and and some of the the I wouldn't necessarily say trials, but some of the the uh, interaction they had with the uh, the establishment at the time, uh, and getting some of their their uh, views accepted, um, and and the resistance they faced, uh, even in the face of the evidence, and so. Uh, I thought it was a very well done. It, it's it's a lot of. It, it, it's it's a, a sequence of interviews for the most part with the principals that were involved in the formation of DFA and other key personnel related to uh, the ongoing uh, operation of the firm. Uh, I thought it was just, I thought it was an uh, amazing thing. I, uh, when it, I didn't want it to be over when it was done because I found it interesting, but then I'm a nerd. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Chris, how about you? Oh, I just, I, I loved seeing older people in the audience will relate to this. I loved seeing all the historical computing technology 
the Hollerith cards, the paper yep. tape, the mag, the magnetic tape, you know, it, it brought back memories, which is dating me. You know, I, 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 I worked with a lot of that technology back in the day. And it was interesting to think how, you know, by modern standards with stone knives and, and uh, you know, these rudimentary tools, people yeah. were trying to bring the world of personal finance out of the dark ages. And yeah. it was interesting to hear the story of how, how, how sparse data was, how hard it was mm -hmm. to get the information to make the conclusions that have fueled modern finance, modern portfolio theory, modern investing. Mm -hmm. And so my comment to you, Paul, was we stand on tall shoulders and I, I was very humbled by it. I was also really impressed by the intellect of the people that were interviewed. Um, some of the material, I, I think I, I will never understand. But the key principles that will drive my investing are easy and simple to understand. And so that it's a nice combination because I think the things that most of us need to act on are very simple. You know, the idea that the market is efficient, you know, it's got noise, but it's efficient. And so we shouldn't get too hung up over the, the, the news of the day, market timing, you know, all of the temptations to try and do something different it's better just to put your money in and and look away and and let it grow as long as you put it in to something that's prudent and wise yeah and and it 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 does remind me uh how how how, how different uh, those who are really committed to something how different it is the process is from the people who just haven't learned how to deal with the challenges of, of the market. Mm -hmm. I convinced a dear friend to put some money in small cap value and not, not much, but some. And, uh, and after a, a, a probably a six month period, uh, we were talking and I asked him uh, how he was feeling about his small cap value. And he said, well, I sold it. I sold it. I said, well, why? Well, it just wasn't doing what I expected. And 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 it just when you when when you know the thinking behind what people like DFA and I put Avantis in the very I mean the people at Avantis are, are they came from DFA. So yeah. it's they have a lot in common, but but uh, that commitment to doing the right thing all of the time. Uh, I, I and, and of course, all of the time may be an overstatement, but uh, at least that's the sense that I get. And to know that the data that we use, and it's not the only source of data we have, but an but a, a important part of the data that we use is data that was developed and accumulated from these people uh, who have a level of commitment to understanding investing at a level that I, I think few have. So uh, it made me feel really proud to be some part of it. And it also gave me a huge sense of trust with the money that my wife and I have invested for retirement and that, that you guys probably have some in these similar kinds of funds. It feels like the right thing to do. I mean, it's that's an, an intuition thing. Uh, uh, and we're not supposed to be feeling, but I'm feeling really good. And I also am feeling that we we have been on this discussion now for about an hour. And uh, I had some other topics. There are lots of questions we're going to have to take up in the next uh, uh, get together that we have uh, that uh, uh, you guys will be will be great on. And so um, thanks for doing it again. Thanks for all your work. This is going to be the best year ever in terms of what we have produced to help people. And it's because of your work that that's happening. And I want to say thank you. I talked to uh, Craig Apple today, who has uh, is behind the, the creator of the investment lifetime investment calculator. And uh, he's sitting there and he's just he's excited as could be to get the final number so he can update update his calculator uh, uh so people can 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 use it with all the 
recent data. So um, thanks to both of you for all that you do and to Craig as, as well. So uh, we'll see you guys soon. Any last words, you, anything that you want to say to people that right now they're trying to figure out, do I go into the market now or do I wait for the pullback? What do you say, Daryl, in or hold? Well, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. So if, you're, if you, you need to get into the market, then you need to get into the market. It doesn't matter what it's doing right now because you can't time it anyway, in my opinion. So but I want to be careful. Late. It's never the right time to do the wrong thing or it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. Think about that. Chris, what, a, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> maybe I said it. Maybe I said it wrong, but it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. So there, which means Wait a that, minute. that if you want, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing, or it's never yeah, the right if time. If it's the right do. thing, if it's the right thing, then there you need to do it. All right, that's good, Chris. Yeah. Well, how about you? I, you know, I don't know what the year will be like, but I'm optimistic about the long term, and I think that's where most that's where I'd like my kids to be, and that's where I'd like most of the people listening us to us to be. It's, I think, uh, Triumph of the Optimists. That was the title of, I think it was Ibbotson's book on long-term investing. And I, I think I think that that is the story of investing. You know, for the long run, be an optimist. Humanity is incredibly ingenious. And uh, I'm so happy that every day, millions of people are going to work for people who hold the total market and are working hard to earn a living, to improve the world, to increase their earnings, to beat the competition. It's, um, I, I think the future should be bright in the long run. In the short run, I have absolutely no idea. But I would like to ask anybody in the audience who has feedback on the portfolio, uh, the uh, portfolio configurator Great. to give me Give me feedback in the comments or uh, send us a note. I'm always trying to make it better. And uh, I really appreciate them listening too. Super. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're the reason we're here. And uh, uh, the more we hear from you, the, the, the better we know what to do. So thanks to those of you who do take the time to sit down and uh, and give us suggestions so let's have a great year together thank you we're just winging this today right because i have no idea what paul is the master of ceremonies nothing. you and i are along for the ride <laughs> yeah i've got nothing to contribute today so well i'm sure um, I, i'm sure you will and i see yeah you got your head on your shoulders so you brought something to share <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, okay, gentlemen.